A historic attempt to land the first commercially developed spacecraft on the moon ended in failure yesterday after the company behind it, Japan's iSpace, lost contact with the vehicle. It's the second risky and expensive space endeavor to make headlines in the last week. You might recall SpaceX's Starship exploded minutes after its highly anticipated launch. For more on what this means for the growing space economy, let's bring in Chad Anderson. He's managing partner of Space Capital. Chad, nice to have you with us. Hi, John. I can't think of a moment where there's been more talk about the promise of space and the space economy, uh, but the stakes are high because everybody's watching. Uh, what do these high-profile mishaps mean? Yeah, well, I mean, look, the, the title of first commercial lander to successfully land on the moon is still up for grabs, but um, iSpace is undoubtedly now the most advanced. You know, I think with something that's this new and this ambitious, it's unreasonable to expect that it will go perfectly on the first try. But we are definitely making progress. Um, and we have multiple shots on goal coming up. Their uh, iSpace itself has missions two and three underway. Sounds like they uh, got really great data all the way up until right before um, it hit the lunar surface. And so they can use that to feed into their, their next attempts. There's a couple more missions coming up this year. Astrobotic um, being one of them, a portfolio company of ours. Lunar Outpost launching with intuitive machines. And so this is really sort of kickstarting um, our commercial efforts um, and, and laying the groundwork for the first for the long term human presence on the moon. Well, on that note, how much money are we seeing invested in into the private space economy? Well, so um, really the only reason we're talking about space as an investment category is because of SpaceX when they brought the lock cost of launch way down a little over a decade ago. So we've seen now we've gone from essentially zero to 270 billion dollars of, of private um, equity capital of going into 1700 unique space companies over the last 10 years. So things are really ramping up, although um, the broader tech sector and the venture market more generally is in a bit of a slowdown right now. And that's definitely affecting uh, space companies as well, uh, considering that venture capital investors make up the majority of capital in this category. It's about two thirds of all capital and, and about three quarters of all rounds. So the broader tech sector slowdown is really, really affecting space companies as well. And what's the determining factor as to whether or not those space companies come to the public markets? Obviously, SpaceX itself is a, is a private company, but Elon Musk very familiar with the public markets as well. We have seen some players, obviously, over the years and more recently as publicly traded vehicles. Uh, is that complicated just when the stakes are so high and everybody's watching and we're, we're sort of on a new frontier here? Absolutely. I mean, this is a really interesting question you're asking because we've actually seen this um, play out with with some of the SPAC companies that have gone public a little bit prematurely. It's important to, to remember where we are in the development of this category. Again, you know, it wasn't it was just a little over a decade ago that SpaceX en enabled this market and removed the barriers to entry for new companies to come in and try innovative new strategies and business models. And so, um, you know, we're kind of on the front end of this and we're starting to see some companies, you know, some companies went public prematurely. They were pre-profit, pre-revenue, and, and many of them were even pre-product. And so they're actually now, you know, iterating and trying very difficult things, but they're doing it on a very public stage. And building a product on a public stage like this is, is really, really difficult. You know, kudos to iSpace for live streaming their event. Right. Uh, and we even referenced uh, what in this country, we just saw this partnership that involves SpaceX and Rogers. I mean, as much as we think about, you know, the exciting uh, trips to whether it's the moon or Mars, um, um, this space economy also involves, you know, uh, people accessing phone service, I would imagine, longer term. Yeah, and I mean, this is just one of a dozens of announcements that have happened recently. SpaceX and T-Mobile, um, Apple and Global Star. I mean, there are many of these um, direct from satellites, direct to cell phone um, partnerships that have been announced between satellite communications and telcos. And so this is a huge area of opportunity. But, you know, this is satellite communications is a key area that we've seen um, over the last couple of years. We've really seen it, you know, it's the growing capabilities of commercial space companies in conflict zones like Ukraine, keeping the Ukrainians connected, and the ability to connect remote operations and remote industrial 
operations. Um, and then geospatial intelligence, of course, earth imaging, um, and uh, this really valuable data about what's happening on the surface of our planet is, is you know, helping with conflict zones and giving a, a foundation of truth for what's happening on the ground, but it's also helping us enable, you know, helping us understand our changing climate and address it as well.